Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure to talk to you about the sense of hearing. Hearing is one of the most incredible senses of the human body, and I hope that this discussion helps to illuminate it, but more importantly, I hope it intrigues you and it wants you, uh, it leads you to want to study it more. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Um, I'm more in awe of the hearing than I am in terms of my understanding of it in terms of a measure. And so I just um, want to tell you that it's such an incredible thing. And so the purpose of this video is to sort of walk you through the anatomy and then uh, introduce a little bit of the physiology of hearing. Um, and so let's let's get right into that discussion. And so one of the things about the ear is that most people think that the ear is just this outer part right here of this fleshy cartilage structure called the auricle or pinea. But in fact, this is just a collector that gathers in sound waves. And so that's one of the first things that I want to mention is that hearing is all about collecting frequencies of sound. And these are waves that travel through the air. And so the ear could be subdivided into three parts. It has something called the outer ear. Which, let me start to highlight some of these things. The outer ear, which comprises this auricle, sometimes known as the pinea, and the ear canal, which is sometimes called the auditory meatus. And so this is the outer ear right here. And then the middle ear, which is inside, you can't see it, uh, is comprised of the eardrum and these three little bones right here that we'll, we'll talk about. There's one there, one there, and one there. They're called ossicles, and they're called auditory for hearing, auditory ossicles. And these vibrate, which are really cool. And then this inner structure right here is the inner ear. It sort of looks a little bit like a snail. It's called the cochlea. We'll, we'll be talking about it. And these three rings called semicircular canals, which are responsible for balance and maintaining equilibrium. That won't be part of our discussion in this video, but it's, but it's pretty interesting. We're going to focus in on hearing. And ultimately, hearing is occurring in the cochlea right here. Although I could say honestly, the truth is hearing really occurs in the brain because nerve impulses from the cochlea travel all the way up into the temporal lobe of the brain. And that's where hearing is detected and also perceived in terms of understanding. And then we can get into a discussion of uh, there's a tube that branches off from the middle ear uh, a tympanic cavity right here, which connects to the oral cavity called the eustachian tube, which helps to balance uh, air pressure in the middle ear. So that's kind of a cool discussion too. So first off, uh, from the outside in, you know, we have this pinea outside here in this, this uh, auricle, and its function is it's sort of curved in order to capture the most sound waves for, for humans. But in other animals, I just wanted to point out, it has a variety of, of, of functions. Like for example, in this, in this rabbit, uh, one of the functions of it is not only for hearing, but it's also to dissipate uh, heat. And so this is a good way for heat to radiate out of the bunny's body if it's getting very hot. But ultimately its job is to capture sound. And so here's an African elephant. I know it's an African elephant because the ear is shaped like Africa. And so again, it's auricle or pinium uh, has a dual functionality. It also helps to dissipate heat because it gets really hot in the savanna of Africa. How do we know this? Because you can, you can study elephants with thermal cameras and actually see most of the heat radiating from the auricle of the ear. It's kind of neat. And then, of course, this is Mr. Spock, a science officer on board the Enterprise. He has an interesting auricle because it's kind of pointy, which is characteristic of the species of Vulcan. And so what happens is sound waves travel in from the outside and they get collected by the pinea and then they travel down the ear canal. The ear canal could also be called the auditory meatus. And that's if I were to animate it, I'd show it like this waves of sound being captured and then they move through the ear canal and their goal is to vibrate the ear drum. And so you may know, practically speaking, that sometimes the ear canal uh, is, is lined with little tiny glands that secrete wax that accumulate in the ear canal. And the function of the wax is not to cause us trouble, but it's actually to prevent uh, microorganisms from infecting the eardrum. So excessive earwax could be a problem. 
uh, as you know. And so the ear itself, when I say ear, the pinea, I, it's composed of elastic cartilage and there's some adipose tissue being shown here. And so one of the things about the hearing is that um, historically speaking, when people had difficult time hearing, uh, one way to increase the ability to hear is to cup your hand around the, your pinea like this or bend it forward in order to accentuate the ability to capture uh, sound. And so this was a, a well-known fact. And so uh, these inventions called ear trumpets were created. At first, they were created with just hollowed out horns. Uh, but then you can sort of make them out of brass and, and make elaborate ones. And so this assists. You could stick this into the into your auricle and it'll assist you. But of course, today we have modern um, hearing aids, which help to increase a person's ability to hear. And so again, sound is a wave. And so it comes in mechanically speaking. And so a wave is a wavelength is a measure from crest to crest or trough to trough. And wavelengths could be short waves, which are high frequency or longer waves, which are low frequency. Okay. And so these are picked up in by your pinea and they travel down the aud auditory meatus and they end up vibrating uh, the eardrum. Now, a measure, and just to acknowledge this, when you when you may have heard of the term decibel, in terms of when you're talking about a sound's loudness, like when I talk about a wavelength, I'm, this is not what I'm talking about. If I'm talking about the amplitude or the height of the wave, it can vary in terms of sound intensity. So the loudness of a sound depends on the amplitude of the wave. In other words, the height. The bigger the amplitude, the lou louder the sound. So we can measure these, and it's like, well, we're Where's the term decibel even coming from? It comes after in honor of Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone, kind of appropriate tribute there. And so, as it turns out, uh, since the bell is a, is a large unit, uh, we usually express sounds as tenths of, of a bell or deci, which is a tenth of a bell or decibels or just dB. So you may know just from you know <laughs> your own personal experience, that things that are really um, loud can be detrimental to the ear. And so there's a detrimental sound, and then there's sort of like normal conversational sound, and then there's really uh, soft sounds. And so you can look at that in terms of decibels. And so there's meters that will uh, be appropriate. I don't know if someday you find yourself working in an area where there's uh, a, a great amount of sound. Uh, if, you're, if you're living next to an airport or something like that, it might be a, a concern for you, repeated sound, or if you're playing in a band or a marching band, for example, this could be possibly detrimental uh, uh, for extended purposes. So I'll just put that out there. So as I mentioned again, just in terms of anatomy, the outer ear is composed of the pinea and auditory meatus. The inner ear is comprised of the tympanic membrane, which is called the eardrum. And these three auditory ossicles and, and the middle ear is in this tympanic uh, cavity right there, and there's the eustachian tube. And then the inner ear is comprised of the cochlea, which is this sort of spiral-shaped bony structure, which is hollow in the inside with, with fluid. And then these semicircular canals, which are responsible for balance, and hearing occurs here in the cochlea. So uh, again, more anatomy. So here's your auricle. Here's a nice look at the pinea. It's made up of cartilage and with a lot of adipose tissue in your lobe. Okay, and then here's your auditory meatus coming in or ear canal. The eardrum is also known as the tympanic membrane. And then here's the names of these auditory ossicles in order of, of their location. The bone, the little tiny bone that's in direct contact with the eardrum is called malleus. And then that vibrates when sound hits the eardrum. You know, the interesting thing about timp comes from a Latin root meaning meaning drum. And so uh, it's literally sound is hitting this and it's vibrating, which is then gonna vibrate the malleus, which is then gonna vibrate the incus, which is then gonna vibrate the stapes. So these are the three auditory ossicles or three bones of the middle ear. And then that in turn, collides with this structure back here, uh, which is called the cochlea. And then ultimately the cochlea will turn sound 
vibrations, physical sound vibrations, and we'll talk about that, into electrical impulses or an action potential. And then ultimately that gets transmitted through the vestibular cochlear nerve, I know that's a mouthful, all the way to the temporal lobe of the brain where you actually hear. Where the stapes is actually in contact with this bony inner ear is something called the oval window. And so it vibrates along that membrane. And then we'll talk about how the inside of the cochlea is made up of, of a fluid called lymph. And then that, that sort of sloshes along and then it's dampened at the round window. And so that's where it actually uh, stops sloshing around. And then uh, again, this tympanic cavity is right in here. It's, it's usually filled with air and it's in equal pressure with the oral cavity, which is down here. This is connected to your to the oral cavity or your throat or pharynx. The auditory tube is sometimes known as the eustachian tube more commonly. And again, this is the bone. So all of this is enclosed in bone. It's very, very small. So it's, it's really uh, interesting to, to get a sense of that. So let's look more formally at the middle ear. So again, the middle ear is, another way of saying middle ear is tympanic cavity. And that's what houses these auditory ossicles. And this is what they look like. The malleus and the incus. Do you notice how there's a little impression right there? That's where this is sort of hitting. And so, and here's the stapes. You know, it's, it's interesting that uh, people get creative in terms of, you know, these are the actual anatomical names, but people, when they look at this, looks a little bit like a hammer this looks a little bit like an anvil where you'd sort of pound a hammer if you're trying to bend metal, for example. So it's hammer, anvil, and this looks like a stirrup right here where you put your foot in if you're riding a horse. And so this is sometimes known as the hammer, anvil, and uh, stirrup right in here, but it's malleus, incus, and stapes. You know, you, we've, we've, got a, we've got 206 bones in the body, and without these three tiny bones, we don't hear so they're rather significant. And so, again, I, I really like this diagram. It's a great shot of the tympanic cavity, which is right here. So the middle ear is the eardrum right in here. And then there's your hammer, anvil, and stirrup right there. Or uh, malleus, incus, and stapes right there. And what's fascinating is, again, because they're bones, this is a great anatomical uh, drawing because you can see here these little white connective tissue are, are, of course, ligaments, which are holding these bones together. That's, that's pretty neat. So here is the, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup right in here. The stirrup is the stapes. And so all of these are going to be vibrating in unison. So when the eardrum vibrates, it causes a cascading vibration in the middle ear, and all three of these bones begin to vibrate. And ultimately, they push on the cochlear uh, window called the oval window, and that's going to cause fluid to slosh a little bit. Again, more pictures. Here's the malleus right there. It looks a little bit like a hammer, and this looks a little bit like an anvil, if you're familiar with what an anvil. I recommend that you, um, that you search an image on the internet of an anvil, and you'll get a sense of it. I'm not sure if we're, most of us understand what that looks like, but it, once you see a picture of an anvil, you'll, you'll know why that's called that. And then this is the stirrup right there, or stapes. Um, when I say that these are three tiny bones, I really mean they're tiny because look at this hammer. It's, it's uh, only a, a fraction of, of a penny in size, but it's rather significant. And look at the anvil right here again, very small, and the stapes. So collectively, they don't even make up the diameter of a, of a dime. So what, what's their purpose? You know, what are these bones doing? Well. They're transmitting sound from the outside, the physicality of the sound, and they're transmitting it to the inner ear, which is where you actually hear in the cochlea. You hear in the inner ear. So what's the point of these bones? Well, they do two things. They, as you can see, the, the tympanic membrane is rather large in order to capture all these sound waves. So what, what they do is that they can channel the vibrations and focus them into this oval window. And by uh, reducing that surface ratio, they can amplify the sound and really conduct um, a really good signal to the cochlea. 
So it goes from a, a wide surface area to a small surface area. And they also act as a, as a lever, which also increases the ability for the inner ear to pick up the sound. And so they, they, they're a lever in a surface area, but basically in general, uh, they're vibrating, which is transmitting the sound to the inner ear. And again, here's the eustachian tube coming off our auditory canal. Uh, beautiful picture of a healthy eardrum. So when a physician is checking out the inside of your ear, this is what you would want it to look like. This is your eardrum. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, infections that can occur, as you can imagine, uh, because the ear canal is open to the outside, and, and so germs are always wanting to come in and try to infect the eardrum. Uh, again, here's a cartoon drawing of the tympanic membrane, and here's the tympanic cavity, which is comprised of the eardrum and your three auditory ossicles. Um, so I love this picture uh, because it gives you some perspective in terms of the size. I told you that those auditory ossicles are small, but this whole you know, middle ear, inner ear structure is very small relative to the whole skull. And so uh, look at its location as well. Here's the eustachian tube, which is connecting to the back of the throat or pharynx right here. And so there's a connection between this and the oral cavity and the nasal cavity. And so there's, uh, it helps to equalize pressure. Sometimes when we fly um, in an airplane, our ears need to um, sort of pop to allow the pressure to equalize between the, the middle ear and the outer ear. Uh, and so you're, you're probably familiar with that. And the eustachian tube serves to do that. Sometimes there's infection that happens here as well. Sometimes you'll get some germs coming into the body and you'll have an, a middle ear infection that can be rather painful. It, help, it sort of prevents us from hearing really well. And it's usually accompanied by if there's an infection, a fever, and there's uh, you know, inflammation, it makes it, things worse. And so antibiotics are usually a, the way to do that. One way to equalize the pressure, as you may know, is yawning, and that causes the uh, the eardrum to, to to pop out. And you want the eardrum to be uh, uh, flexible in order to hear. If, if the pressure is off, the, the tympanic membrane doesn't vibrate properly, and it, and it makes us feel like uh, our ears are plugged. But in fact, they're not really plugged. It's just the pressure is off. And so the eustachian tube uh, serves to equalize air pressure on both the middle ear and the outer ear, and so that's, that's pretty important. Uh, so the inner ear. So the inner ear is, is going to be the focus of our conversation from this point on, and it's, it's rather interesting. And this is where I think the, the magic occurs inside the ear. This is ultimately, we're going to get into a discussion right now about how you're actually hearing me. How not only you're hearing me, but how you're interpreting what I'm saying as well. And all of this, this is a real picture of the cochlea. And this is a bony structure. It's a coiled bony structure. And it's kind of like a, a, the, a bony labyrinth. There's tubes inside and there's fluid inside here. And I mentioned that the fluid is called lymph and that's in general. And so what happens is uh, the, the stapes uh, pushes on the oval window and that causes the fluid to slosh around inside the cochlea. And so you're wondering how can fluid moving around allow me to hear? It's quite, it's quite magnificent. So again, just to review the overall structure, we're going to be focusing in right here in, in the cochlea, which is part of the inner ear. These semicircular canals are also part of the inner ear, but they're, again, I mentioned this, they're responsible for balance and maintaining equilibrium. So sound waves are coming in, they're captured by the auricle, they move down the audit auditory meatus, they then vibrate the tympanic membrane, which then causes the oscillation of these auditory ossicles, the malleus, incus, and stapes, which then pushes on the oval window, and you get this sloshing effect of fluid, which is occurring inside the cochlea. So this lymph is actually inside the cochlea, which is bony on the outside, but there's a membrane on the inside. And so let's let's get into that. And so I pulled this picture up because this, this is something, I don't know if they still sell something like this, but I recall this uh, this thing uh, at like a, the mall when I was young. They're, they're sort of like this, uh, I don't know, <laughs> plastic container with like a wave inside and it would go back and forth and it would cause like fluid to slosh back and forth. 
And so this is what I imagine the inside of the cochlea being, being like. When sound waves are striking it, it causes the lymph to slosh back and forth. So that's, that's a, your visual image of that. And again, going from, from um, big idea all the way to small, outer ear, here's the middle ear, and then here's the inner ear right here, the cochlea. And so here's a close-up of the tympanic uh, cavity, which houses the membrane, the auditory ossicles. And then here is the round, uh, here's the oval window, that's what I want to talk about. So the stapes comes in contact with the oval window, which causes the fluid to slosh inside the cochlea. So in order to understand sound, we really need to sort of uh, dissect the cochlea. And so our conversation is, is about the cochlea. And so when you look inside the cochlea, and this is the part that's somewhat challenging, it takes a little while to get familiar with this. Picture the, the cochlea as being uh, a sort of like a snail. It's all coiled up like this. And so this outer part is bone, okay? So that's what you're looking at right there. But if you look inside, if you cut it cross-section, there's a tube inside that is not made up of bone. And the tube inside is called the cochlear duct. So here comes some anatomy, but don't worry. Uh, cochlear duct, and inside the cochlear duct is where you're actually hearing. But if you put a tube inside, that means that there's going to be a cavity or a canal on top of that tube and on the bottom of that tube. And so just for sake of purpose for our, our conversation. Let's name these things. This is the vestibular cavity, and this is the tympanic cavity. And so ultimately, I won't get into it right now, but ultimately within the cochlear duct, there's a smaller unit called the, um, the organ of cordy, named after an Italian biologist. And that's where hearing is actually going to take place. And so we'll get into that conversation in a moment. But I like this picture because it sort of looks at the cochlea, and it's made up of bone. And here's that membranous tube inside called the cochlear duct. And so back where I was mentioning the two cavities, I'll mark it here and here. And so there's really three things that are happening. Like, let's go back here. Um, here's the vestibular cavity. Right here is the vestibular cavity right in here. And so there's fluid in here. And so you're like, well, if this is lymph and there's lymph in here and lymph in here, I might get confused. This is called peri, so peri, peri lymph. And so this is where the vibration of the stapes is hitting the oval window, causing the paralymph to slosh. Inside the cochlear duct, it's called endolymph, because it's inside. Endolymph, I can go a different color, go green inside. So this is the endolymph inside. And then more on the outside is paralymph. And so this is, these are the, the three, if you were to cut the cross section across, you would see a tube there, the inner tube, and then this tube right there. And so it's like there's a balloon-like structure that's flexible inside of something that's more like a pipe on the outside. And so hearing is going to take place inside the cochlear duct. Because inside the cochlear duct, there's going to be cells in this little uh, organ called the organ of cordy. And so this is significant. We'll get into it in momentarily. But there's extensions of these cells that, that are protruding up in, in the organ of cordy. And, and these cells are called hair cells. But in fact, they act as, your, as specialized sensory neurons. Because what they can do is, when they're physically influenced by the wave of lymph, they're physically altered as a result of the sound, that's going to cause an action potential to take place. The physicality of the lymph causing the hairs to bend will allow the hair cells to be more permeable to calcium. And as calcium uh, is able to travel in, that causes an action potential to take place in, in, in the cell. And so ultimately, the cell becomes um, depolarized and then a nerve impulse travels uh, to the brain. And so it's a, it's a real cool example of how physical can be turned into electrical, and then ultimately it's picked up. And so this conversation is happening over here in the cochlea. 
And so the round window is here, and you can see that here's the cochlear duct right inside. Okay, the cochlear duct is in purple right here. And so inside the cochlear duct is your endolymph, and then on the two outer pockets are the paralymph. So those are the chambers uh, on the outside here. Okay, and so I find this picture to be helpful as well. So sound is coming in this direction. It's coming in from the oval window, like this, from the stapes. And it's causing this paralymph to oscillate. And so this chamber is called the scala vestibuli. How's that? Vestibuli. And what's interesting is the cochlea reminds me a little bit of, here's an analogy, of those toys when you were, when you were young. Uh, at a birthday party that's sort of coiled up and when you blow on it, it becomes really long. Or it also reminds me of a trombone. If you're familiar with the trombone, it has the slide that can go in and out. And as it turns out, when the slide is all the way in, or it's the shortest distance, that's where you can play the highest notes. And when you pull the slide out really far, that's when you play the, the lower notes. And so this functions in this, in this manner. High frequency sounds high frequency sounds come in and are sloshed here and they cause the cochlear duct to bend right over here. And so high frequency sounds are picked up very early in the cochlea. Whereas a low frequency sound travels all the way around right here, travels all the way around here, and it might be picked up over here in the cochlear duct. So low frequency and high frequency are early and everything in between. It's quite remarkable. And so check this out also. Um, the, the paralymph is sloshing around, around like this. I'll follow the perilymph like this. It comes around the apex of the cochlear duct. And here it's coming all the way back like this. And then ultimately it travels in this direction on the out and it travels in this direction on the way back. So it's a, it's scalia tympani causes the fluid to dampen at the round window. So there's two windows here. So s sound in and then the, the water is dampened over here. Okay, so inside the cochlear duct is where hearing is taking place. So let me show you over here. Let's, let's take a, a moment away from the, the PowerPoint notes to take a look at this video. I think it's kind of interesting. Sound waves strike. Let me put the sound down. So, here they're striking the, uh, the eardrum, causing it to oscillate. And then you can see the auditory ossicles, the malleus, incus, and stapes are vibrating, which is amplifying the signal. It's then tapping on the round window. Now, do you notice here, here's the paralymph, okay, in the, in the scala vestibuli right here. And these are, the these are the high notes. And as you can see, the lower notes are gonna be back over here. And then the paralymph, then travels back in the scalia tympani, and they're da uh, dampened over here in the round window. So high notes are occurring here early, and then lower notes are occurring way back over there. And so it's, it's fascinating. And so you're like, okay, I can kind of appreciate this. This outer part's bony, and inside it's filled with fluid, and apparently this cochlear duct can bend. But how is it exactly that sound can turn into an electrical impulse? Okay, so we need to consider that. How does sound turn into an electrical impulse? So let's consider this video as well. So here's sound. This is sort of a little review of some of the things that we're talking about, but it's going to lead in. So sound's traveling through our auricle. It's then channeled down the auditory meatus. It's then causing the... Uh, tympanic membrane or eardrum to, to vibrate, which is then in turn going to cause the malleus to vibrate, which is then going to push on the uh, anvil or incus, which is then going to cause your stapes uh, or stirrup to press right here on this bony structure of the oval window. Here's your round window. And then this is the cochlea. And what's fascinating is that this is going to cause the lymph inside to slosh around and when the lymph sloshes around ultimately the physicality of that is going to push on the hair cells which are going to cause an action potential and then that's going to travel to the brain and so it's really cool 
it's the lymph that's going around causing sloshing to take place, but ultimately it's resulting in a nerve impulse to the brain. And so I find that that is, um, I don't know, one of, one of the most interesting things about uh, the senses of the body, how we can go from the senses from the outside to, to the inside. And so what this is getting into in terms of uh, frequency, in terms of hertz, that the, that the highest frequency sounds are picked up early in the cochlea and the lower fr uh, frequencies are picked up uh, a little bit further in the cochlea. In other words, low notes down there, high notes are over here in this area. And so this is a great animation showing what's happening. This is inside the cochlear duct. This is the organ of Cordy. And so when the, the paralymph pushes down on the cochlear duct, it's going to cause right in here, this is the endolymph right in here. It's going to cause this little membrane right here to press down on the hair cells. Let's take a look at that. And so when it presses on these hair cells, the physicality of pressing on them is going to allow them to uh, become excited. In other words, depolarize and an action potential then travels up to the brain and you're able to hear sound. And so all of that's happening inside the cochlea. So that's, that's pretty incredible if you ask me. And so um, let's take a look if I can pull the notes back up. Let's see if we can do that. Come over here. Let's go like that. And then this will make it come up. Okay. So here we go. So the oval window is vibrated. Uh, it, we're going in this direction. So here's the, the paralymph. Here's the endolymph. Right here is more paralymph on the outside. Um, the vibrations are traveling in the cochlea in the form of lymph. And so let's focus now inside the, the cochlear duct at the organ of Cordy. So that little membrane right here in blue is really significant because when the paralymph sloshes, ultimately it's going to be pushing down on this tectorial membrane, an important term. The tectorial membrane then sort of taps on these hair cells. And so the, the physicality of the tectorial membrane touching the hair cells causes an action potential, and that's how we're able to hear. Uh, again, this is a, a model of that. So the, the fluid is coming in this uh, scala vestibuli direction. It's then pushing down uh, on this membrane, which is causing the uh, endolymph to slosh around. And here's the tectorial membrane, which is then touching the hair cells, which are in the organ of Cordy. That's kind of interesting right there. And so again, here's the uh, cochlear duct. Here's the tympanic uh, uh, temporal membrane right there. And here again is a beautiful electron micrograph, scanning electron micrograph of all these little hairs that are coming out in, uh, in the organ of Cordy right there. And so the cochlear duct uh, is what's causing the sound to be heard. So it's pretty interesting. And then again, here again, more electron micrograph showing the hair cells. And so it's a beautiful example of how vibration causes an influx of calcium, which then is ultimately causes an action potential uh, by the release of, by more calcium coming in, sends neurotransmitters from those vesicles of the axon uh, and then to nearby neurons and then the nerve impulses is, is uh, coming up. So this tectorial membrane is rather critical. It's the one that's tapping on the hair cells, making it happen. But the only reason that this would be tapping is that the endolymph would be pushing on it. That's because the paralymph is pushing down uh, on the cochlear duct. And then all of this is then traveling up into the brain and we're able to hear it and not only hear sound, but understand sound and then also remember things. And so it's incredible. Um, hope you enjoyed that discussion of the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear in terms of hearing. Thanks for watching.